Patron Saints of Nothing by Randy Rebe, page 202, a universe where people do not die for doing what is right. This is Reina, Mia says. She says your cousin used to live here. With her, I ask, mind reeling, attention fixed on the kid, a girl of maybe two or three. She's wearing an oversized, dingy tank top, but no pants or diaper. Mia nods for almost two years. Is that... I start to ask, but hesitate. I'm not ready to know. <laughs> Instead, I take in my surroundings with new eyes, trying to grasp how my brilliant, compassionate cousin, who was bursting with energy, could have ended up in the slums. I try to imagine him begging for money, playing cards, selling cheap merchandise, or silently watching from the shadows. I try to put his face onto these people I regarded as faceless until this moment. But I can't. I can't picture June in such poverty. And suddenly, as the reality of this place sinks in, all of this seems improbable. Maybe she's lying trying to scam money out of us. The woman named Raina says something. She's not comfortable with both you and me going in, Brian Santos explains to me. Why not? We're men. I understand. This happens more than you might think, but I'm basically useless in Visaya anyway. I will wait downstairs. Then he turns to Mia, holding up his notepad. Make sure to take good notes. Mia holds up her phone. Kids, he mutters, smiling, and then descends. With that... <clears throat> Raina steps aside and gestures for Mia and me to enter the home where she lived with June, to enter the space they shared. We slip off our shoes and walk in. If we were more structurally sound, I might call this place a loft. It's in the middle of the slums, but it rises above the other structures, overlooking a patchwork of sea rust, sea of rust green and metal on all sides, encircled by the smoggy Manila skyline. The living space seems two or three times the size of the homes we passed below, and with an open floor plan, though nothing here seems planned, Air flows freely and natural light pours in. Overall, it is a jarring contrast to the cracked casket atmosphere from which we climbed. As impressive and surprising it is, as it is, though, it still carries the same air of impertinence and instability as the other improvised structures in the neighborhood. The floor is uneven planks of scrap wood. The walls are sheets of plywood, and the roof is corrugated aluminum. The skeleton of wooden beams is dark with age and rot, and the windows that allow for the 360-degree view of the city are merely gaps in the walls. Raina gestures for us to sit in the plastic lawn chairs around a small table, so we do. The child sits down in front of the TV, which is playing some melodramatic Filipino tel teleseria, while Raina rustles around in the small kitchen that's stocked with old, mismatching appliances, and I'm guessing we're scavenged. At the other end of the space, there are two sets of bunk beds, a hammock, and a cot. Next to them, a lidless toilet. Where does it drain, I wonder? And a plastic bucket of water with a tabo bobbing on the surface. A couple of different clotheslines draped with damp laundry span the length of the apartment, if that's the right word from one corner to the other. After a few moments, Raina sets a sleeve of crackers on the table. She then goes back to the cabinets and returns a second time with three old plastic cups of cloudy water and sits down with us. I'm ridiculously thirsty, but I notice Mia give a small shake of the head to indicate that it is not safe to drink. Though I'm not hungry, I follow Mia's lead and eat a few of the crackers to show my appreciation of the woman's hospitality. They're stale and make my mouth dry, but I smile. Salamat ate, I say, using the older elder sister designation. Mia asks something, Raina nods, then Mia takes out her phone. She pulls up an audio app, hits record, and then sets the phone in the middle of the table. Then they begin talking. I try to follow along, hoping Bisai overlaps enough with Tagalog that I might be able to catch a word here or there. But if they do share any vocabulary, the words slip past me in the air like blackbirds at night. As I wait for translation, my eyes wander. Again, I try and fail to imagine June living here for two whole years before he was killed. If it is true, then that only leaves one year unaccounted for. Still, I find the claim of this woman named Raina hard to swallow. Consider asking me to see if there's any proof that June lived here, but I decide it best to let her steer the conversation. After several minutes, Mia finally turns to me. She's from a part of Cebu that speaks the same Visaya as we do, where I'm from, in Mindanao. She can tell me her story in her own language. That's important in journalism. But June didn't speak that, I say. She shrugs. He must have learned. Oh, I say, wondering if Raina's Tagalog came from June. Before I can ask, Mia continues telling me about Raina. She was the oldest of nine children. When she was 11, some men came to her village. They were traffickers. <laughs> I don't say anything. But nobody knew that at the time. The men said that they were looking for young girls to work overseas as domestics. If anyone went with them, they would pay the family up front, and the girls could send remittances home once they had worked off their initial debt. Beyond that, they claimed the girls would have a better life abroad in Saudi Arabia or America or Singapore or wherever they would be placed. Debt? For training, transportation, employment placement, things like that. Oh, so her father sold her to these men as a slave. Rennie used kinder words to describe the arrangement as her father understood it, but I will name it for what it is. 
Hoffman did not have any intention of helping her to find work as a maid. They brought her to Manila and forced her to work as a... I look at Reina, but she lowers her eyes. I turn back to Mia. Oh. She nods. Right, but after five or six years, she doesn't remember exactly. Your Tita Chato's organization rescued her. Confusion crosses Mia's face. You don't know what your Tita Chato does, do you? I shake my head, ashamed. Your Tita is the director of an organization that helps girls escape such situations as the one Reina was in. Oh, I say, a sadness like sickness settles in the pit of my stomach. The realization that this woman's misfortunes are far from unique. After she was first rescued, rescued Mia continues. She spent several hours in the organization's office. They let her take a shower and give her new clothes. Then your Tita asked her all kinds of questions to try to find out more information about the men who took her from her home and the men who visited her and so on. Then when she was finished that first day, she went home with your Tita to stay there until she could find a more permanent situation for her. And that's how she met June, I say. Reina adds a bit more and smiles. Mia laughs. She said he was very cute. I don't smile with them. Reina was one of Tito Chato's clients, if that's the right word. She came to Tito Chato's house to heal, not to be taken advantage of by another guy. It doesn't seem right that June should have done anything with her, but he clearly did. My eyes go back to the little girl watching TV. Mia goes on. She said that June was very considerate, very sensitive. He probably knew how to act properly because Reina was not the first rescue girl that had stayed with Tito Chato as she had. Anyway, June was not around much. He attended school during the days, and eventually Reina started helping Tita Chato at the office, preparing mailings, calling or emailing to thank donors, and other such tasks. At night, Tita Chato and Tita Inez taught her to do various household chores, but June kept his distance, going about out of his way to make sure they were never alone in the same room together. He avoided eye contact and never spoke to her unless she addressed him first. Even then, he kept his voice soft and his words kind. She says that she appreciated that more than she can say. Reina speaks some more, Mia translates. After a few weeks, Tita Chato told her she had found a place for her to live. It was with a family that had just had a baby. In exchange for a place to live in a small way, she was to care for the child, and it was a good arrangement. She thanked your Tita for giving her the opportunity to live a new life, said goodbye, and went off to live with the family. I feel a flush of pride in Tita Chato, and Mia's face darkens. But the husband, she goes quiet, shakes her head, and shifts her gaze to me. You can probably guess what started to happen. She curses under her breath. It must be Tagalog because I catch nga lalaki, the phrase for men, somewhere in there. Hey, I start to protest. We're not all. Stop me. It cuts me off. Don't make it about you. Just listen. I burn with shame at the instinct to defend myself, but I hold my tongue because I know she's right. During this time, Mia says, she only spoke with your tita periodically for check-ins. She thought of telling your tita what was happening, but that didn't. She stayed silent. Why, I ask. She was ashamed. Tita's organization had already helped her so much, she did not want to trouble them again. Of course, she was afraid what the husband might do to her. You should have told Chato, maybe even gone back, maybe even gone back to her family. But the ones who sold her into slavery? How is she going to get the money to travel? It would have been better than staying in that situation. In that situation. You haven't been in her situation, Jai. Maya tells me with more anger than I expect. You will never be, so you can't possibly understand. Don't be so quick to judge. I keep my mouth shut this time. Mia resumes her conversation with Reina. Several exchanges, and several minutes later, Mia continues the story. Eventually, Reina decided she couldn't take it anymore. She couldn't wait for the next check-in. She swallowed her pride and called your tita Chato. As soon as the call was answered, she said her emotions were like water rushing over a burst dam. She started talking, confessing everything that the husband had done to her, as if they were her own sins. When she stopped speaking, she realized it was not Tita Chato at the other end of the line, but June. She felt overwhelmed with shame that she had told him what she had, but he only asked where she was. She told him the address of the house, and he was on the doorstep an hour later. Again, I think about what my life was like when I was the age June was in this memory. The age Raina must have been, and I feel so young. June asked her if she wanted him to take her back to Tita Chata's house or to the organization's offices. But Raina said, neither. She didn't want to burden your Tita's family anymore when she thought there were other girls that might need the space, and she didn't want another job with another family. So where did they go? Mia gestures around us. Here. I shake my head in disbelief. How in the world could someone choose to live in the slums instead of with Tita Chato? But I guess it's like Mia said. I can't understand. Mia goes back and forth with Reina a bit, and then continues the story. She had June drop her off in these slums so she could make her own way. She made June promise not to tell Tita Chato, since she didn't want Tita Chato to spend any more of the organization's time and resources trying to help her. But June didn't think it was safe, and came here whenever he could. He helped her find a spot to live. He brought her food and water. He helped her ask around for work. As Mia speaks with Reina some more, I shift my legs and think about how this must be the last month June was living with Tita Chato when he was ditching school. I guess the library was a cover. I can also guess where the story is headed, why he left Tita Chato's house. 
Raina starts trying. Mia reaches across the table and takes her hand. They fell in love, Mia says. Well, she fell in love with him first. She said June was so respectful, so kind and gentle. He helped make sure that she was safe and had enough to eat. He made sure the neighbors looked out for her. He was unlike any man she had ever known, and Raina said maybe that's why she started to feel so affectionate toward him. One day, after about two weeks, she asked if he wanted to have sex with her. Oh, I say. Raina speaks, Mia translates, but June said no. He said he was not helping her because he wanted to have sex with her, but because it was the right thing to do. He told her that she was beautiful and kind, but that he could not be with her, that she needed to be alone for a while to learn to care for herself, and things resumed as they had been. Not for long, though, I predict. She nods. About two more weeks passed, and then one day after he had brought her groceries, he confessed that he loved Raina. He asked if he could live with her, and she agreed. I lean, shaking, I lean back, shaking my head. It's wild to imagine all this happening to June while I was on the other side of the world debating strangers on the internet about whether the new Avengers movie would live up to the hype. My heart breaks all over again for my cousin. Why didn't he tell T. Chato at that point, I ask. Why leave and cut off all contact? I think she would have understood. Ate Reina doesn't know why, Mia says. I'm thinking maybe he felt too guilty. He probably knew it was not appropriate to be involved with one of her clients in that way. Reina stands up suddenly and starts rummaging through a drawer. She pulls out a folded piece of paper and hands it to me. Then she smooths down the front of her skirt and sits back down. I unfold the paper and recognize June's handwriting immediately. It looks like a poem with line breaks and stanzas, but it's in either Tagalog or Bisaya. What does it say? I ask Mia, passing it to her. Her eyes skim the page. It's a kundiman, a love song she reads some more. It's actually pretty good. I almost ask her if I can have it, but it's hers in the same way the letters I lost were mine. June used to write her songs and play them for her on the guitar. Did she record any of them, I ask? Mia asks, then listens. Her face falls when Reyna finishes speaking. Yes, many, but she had to sell the phone on the, the videos were saved on. June's guitar she also had to sell to avoid starving. Starving. She probably means it in a different way from how everyone uses it back home. Mia asks Reyna something, and Reyna talks for a few minutes. She smiles several times as she talks, but there's an undercurrent of sadness in her voice. Finally, she falls quiet. Mia says he left school. They both found whatever work they could. He often took odd jobs like working on construction crews or painting buildings, and she washed laundry, cleaned houses, things like that. She said that they were not making a lot of money, but they were making enough to get by. They continued getting to know each other, and they fell more and more in love. Those were the happiest times of her life. The question I, tra I traveled over 8,000 miles to ask tumbles from my mouth. Was June a drug pusher? He asks. I lean forward, holding my breath. Reyna makes a face and then shakes her head emphatically. Voila. No, Mia says. I knew it. I fucking knew it. The June who hugged me after that puppy died, who became a best friend more than a cousin, who wrote me letters for years, whose heart was bigger than anyone else's I've ever known, there was no way he would have sold drugs. He was too good. He was the best of us. He wouldn't have been able to live with himself knowing and feeling the pain and destruction those drugs would have caused. But, I lean forward, did he use? Mia asks. Voila. Another wave of relief washes over me. I exhale, lean back, and look at the underside of the metal roof as I run my hands through my hair. Mia continues translating. It was not enough for June to live his own life. He was always trying to help people, and around here, there is no shortage of those who need help. In particular, he was drawn to the addicts. She said that when your cousin wasn't working, you spent less and less time with her, and more and more trying, time trying to help people get clean, or at least find something to eat. Then she looks to me with a question of her own. Maybe his name ended up on the list by accident? He was spending all his time visiting attics. Someone easily could have thought he was a pusher. Maybe, I say, gazing at the empty space across the table. I'm simultaneously bursting with pride at my cousin's integrity and hating him for his inability to suppress it like the rest of us do with such ease. Even though Mia's theory makes sense, I can't shake the feeling in my gut that Tito Manning had something to do with all of this. Did his hatred for his son truly run that deep? <sighs> I glance at the little girl. Raina said he lived here with her for about two years, Mia nods. It's been three since he ran away from Tita Chato's, so what happened? Mia turns the question to Raina, who looks away. We sit in a heavy silence, waiting for her to answer. Instead, she starts crying. The little girl, concerned, comes over and hugs Raina, then asks something in a small voice. Raina nods, kisses the girl on the top of the head, and then motions for her to return to the TV. She does, and Raina watches her. Raina wipes her eyes and nose, then she says something curtly, without looking at us. Are you fucking kidding me, Mia asks. What, I ask. He left her, Mia says, pissed. They speak a bit more than Mia adds. She woke up the day after Christmas and June was gone. He left a pile of cash and a note apologizing, saying he had to go, that it was what was best for her, but he didn't say why he was leaving, where he was going, or how she could reach him. He must have had a good reason, I say. 
Maybe there was another woman, Mia says, with the bitterness of someone who's been replaced before. June wouldn't have done that. She shoots me a withering look. You haven't noticed a pattern? What do you mean? With June? What are you talking about, Mia? He's a runner, Jay. It's obvious. Things get hard, and he leaves. I shake my head. He shouldn't have left like that. He should have spoken to her, and they could have figured out whatever was going on together. It wasn't fair of him to make that decision himself. He did the same exact thing when he stopped writing you, when he left his family, when he left your tea to Chato. As much love as I have for my cousin, she's right. He was an escape artist. Still, I don't want to acknowledge it. Instead, I gesture with my head toward the little girl sitting on the floor entranced by the TV. Is that his daughter? And he looks at me sympathetically. Are you sure you want me to ask? I nod. She asks Raina. Raina answers. Mia translates. Translates. No, she's the child of one of the other women who live here now. There's a group of them who share this face and support one another. I blink and keep my eyes closed for a few extra moments until a sense of relief and a sense of loss pass through me. Raina says something as she rises out of her chair, and even without the translation, I understand that it's time for us to leave. Mia and I exchange a look, and then Mia stops the recording on her phone and slips it into her pocket. We both stand. Even though I still have so many questions about what happened in the year between when June left Reina and when he was murdered by the police, about what he was like away from everyone else, they start speaking again, Mia not bothering to translate any of it into English for me. While they're distracted, I take the opportunity to leave all the pesos I have with me on the table. I know it's not really going to help too much in the long run, but I feel the need to do something. Maybe I'm starting to hear the same voice June did. Mia and Raina embrace one last time. I want to hug her, too, for sharing a piece of June with me, but given her history, I just give her a small nod, and then we walk over to the door. One more thing I said before we leave. Mia, can you ask her if she knows anything about June running a website like the bookstore owner mentioned? She asks, but Raina shakes her head. Damn, I turn to Raina. I wish I could speak her language so I could offer words of substance, of healing, of light. Instead, all I can say is, Salamat, Ate. But I say it like I truly mean it, because I do. And then I turn and walk away, imagining some parallel universe where June is still alive and married to Raina, and they have a daughter who feels like a niece to me. In that universe, people do not die for doing what is right.